is also for the code. It's about the rat brain robot. Uh, I want to know how that robot is trained. Like you said, its task is to not hit the wall, but how is that task given to it? Okay, I better take those before because I don't have the memory chip in. <laughs> um, I'll start in reverse order to feed it back again. In terms of the rat brain robot, just to be clear, we, we do also have human neurons now. I say human, we buy them from an American company, so they're sort of American neurons. They're almost as <laughs> <terrible. laughs> um, <laughs> Don't make that um, the, the training at the moment, what we do after one or two weeks, we pull round the electrodes, so literally stimulating them with a biphasic signal, which is a typical neuro-stimulating signal, positive, negative, so it doesn't build up charge. And we then monitor where we're getting a reasonably um, re reproductive response. So if we poll on this electrode, then maybe 30 to 40 percent of the time, uh, a few milliseconds later, we will get a response on this other electrode. So we're looking partly initially at an innate development of the brain, how it's developed to a certain extent. We will then connect up that route where there is some repeatability of response. If this electrode gets stimulated, some of the time it pushes a signal out here a time later. We connect that up to the robot and simply put it in the corral and off it goes. And because that particular route is stimulated, and then again it's stimulated, and then again it's stimulated, that habitual process strengthens the, the neural route, it strengthens the pathways. It's just like in humans when you do something and you do something and you do something, say, oh, it's becoming automatic. Well, it is. The, the neural pathways, it's, it's like a motorway through the brain. You do it so often, you almost you don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. But it is your brain operating, but it's straight through. So it's that type of learning, habitual learning we can look at. We can apply different chemicals to the culture to either restrict growth or enhance growth. So chemically we can teach it if you like. If it's, if it's active in a certain way, which is a way we like, we can enhance growth and make it more likely to do that. Or we can restrict growth. We can give it a stroke, if you like, which is another aspect of the research. We can close down part of the brain. So if it's doing something we don't want, then we can simply stop it doing that and, and get it to learn something different. So all the time, chemically we can. Electrically or electrochemically, you know, that's, that's the million dollar question of the If we could figure out how to electrically give a reward to the culture to make it want to do something, then we'd be doing it to all our students straight away. <laughs> no problem at all. Learn this, zing, yeah, that's brilliant, I love it. And, and we'd be billionaires because we'd have the technology that everybody wants. Their children, zing, learn this, don't do that again, zing, that's it. So at the moment we don't know how to do that. But it's interesting to try and, and with the little experimentation we can attempt to see what's possible and what's not. It's a very interesting question. I'm very interested in the population interactions of protocells. So they do actually have group dynamics, and uh, essentially it could be uh, chemical uh, chemical sensing. So they have, uh, undergo chemotaxis. They can detect chemicals in the environment. So you can actually get them to solve the maze. Um, so so they, they do actually navigate complex environments. Not only that, when they start to talk to each other. Um, anthropomorphizing wildly, um, but they, when they start to interact, they actually can undergo phase transition behaviours, which I don't actually understand. Um, but it is based on very physical chemical principles. Can, can I just, uh, just respond to that kind of uh, psychic network around the world? Um, uh, have you, is, it, is it the idea of having an implant that, that appalls you? Because there's a, a technology that was presented by Tan Lee um, at uh, TED Global last year, uh, which is literally like a light headset that you can actually use to manipulate the um, a, a computer interface. Um, because I mean, the, you know, so the idea then of, of having a, a, a mind-operated 
internet around the world doesn't require implants in order to do that. That already exists. There are things like MyTopy software, which are used by disabled people to actually use eye gaze to uh, uh, manipulate matter. So it's it, it, it's there already. Um, it, is it just the interface that uh, is, 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 is But if, if I could interject, I mean, if I had suggested to somebody sitting here with me, I am going to glass lasers into your eyes 15 years ago. I mean, <laughs> most people, you know, we're going to put lasers in your eyes. What? Are you crazy? No way. Now, yeah, I mean, it's new technology, it's new fashion. Because it works, it's successful, people suddenly, hey, my eyesight's fine, it's positive. You know, I mean, why did you have it done? This, having lasers in your eyes would be scary stuff, or would have been 10 years ago. It's much more convenient not to have to bother with the glasses. And people tell me I look slightly less ugly now. <laughs> I didn't comment on that. Yeah. If you imagine now the possibility of being able to communicate just by thinking, the power of that, it's nothing. The telephone was brilliant, phenomenal development of the telegraph. The possibility of thinking and communicating, all the, the colours, images, thoughts, emotions, concepts like that, it is enormous. Just for a little piece of technology, that's all we're talking about here. So I, I feel the buzz and the excitement and the fact that it becomes acceptable, that, that the, the graph that you show, the initial develop, the initial trials, maybe some of them have already happened. From that we learn, it becomes perhaps less invasive, less nasty looking when you see these 100 spikes, something maybe you need, and then I'll do that. But it's just developing the technology. The first cell phones, was in, were enormous house bricks, they, it looked stupid, and, but there were enough people and it pushed the technology and now you can't be without it, so many times. Um, just to define if I could, okay. what it felt like, um, we opened up a new pathway to the brain, effectively. It took six weeks for my brain to learn to recognise pulses that we were inputting. For two weeks, I mean simply I was there in the lab, my researchers would press a button, either it would put a current into my nervous system or it wouldn't. Um, we had to increase the current, we, we started off about 10 microamps, we had to learn what sort of current my brain could record, about 80 microamps biphasic signal before we got there. Two weeks to start tuning in and then another four weeks for my brain to learn to recognise these pulses. So we had opened up effectively at a socket into the brain that we could then use for any input we wanted. So when it was linked to my wife, a signal came in, I knew I was linked to my wife. So when my brain received a signal, that's my wife sending me a signal. It did not feel like pain. It's like you're looking at me now. Your brain is receiving pulses from your eyes. You're not going, oh, I'm going to hurt or anything like that. It's fine, your brain is making sense of the signals. That's what the brains are very good at that, and it, which was a fairly small change, just typically for the sensory input, we were just using one electron, one channel. It was fine for that. With the hand, we got up to about six or seven signals in parallel to get fine control of the hand. So it's very, very low bandwidth, if you like, to, to what it can be in the future. Sorry, Thank you. And um, I'd like to thank our three panellists for their